Okay, today I'm going to talk about urine tract infection in children. I will start with the epidemiology of urine tract infection in children, then move to the risk factors of urine tract infection, to the microorganisms that are responsible for this condition, to the pathogenesis and pathology of urine tract infection. Okay, and after that, I will move to the classification and clinical manifestations of urine tract infection in children. Okay, and then to how to diagnose urine tract infection, the atypical features of UTI, and at the end, I'm going to talk about the management of UTI. Let's just start with the first subject, which is the epidemiology of urine tract infection in children. Okay, in the first one to two years of life, urine tract infection in children is most uh, uh, are most common in males. Okay, so until the second year of life male uh, ratio is more than females after that it is much more common in female due to the short urethra and the wide urethra okay so the overall ratio of urine tract infection children in males children is about one percent is about one to three percent in females so it is most uh, it is more common uh, common in females okay the overall ratio is more in females uh, uh, in the first uh, one to two years of life is more common in male and after that more common in female okay most UTIs occur in the first year okay of the male life okay so the UTI in males are more common to happen in the first year of life okay in females the um, the peak of UTI uh, happens at the fifth year of life uh, in toilet tra training period okay so this is in female in males in one to two years females at the fifth year uh, the most dangerous thing about urine tract infection is that it may cause sepsis and it may cause renal failure as we'll talk in a minute now let's move to the first thing the risk factors of urine tract infection in uh, children okay let's start with the female gender the female gender by itself is a predisposing factor for urine tract infection in children uncircumcised uh, circumcised uh, uh, males okay because there will be a, a smigma okay a collection of uh, uh, bacteria uh, under the prepuce okay so it is more common in uncircumcised circumcised male okay it's major risk factor for uti toilet training also is a risk factor as we said that in female the toilet training period is the peak period to have uti any obstruction will be exposed to urinary tract infection so the presence of stones or tumor okay uh, any obstruction is a predisposing or risk factor for uti pregnancy is a risk factor for uti any congenital anomaly or anatomical anomaly of the renal canal like labial adhesions for example is very important risk factor hypertension why you may ask yourself why hypertension is a risk factor for uti because hypertension most of the times implicate an underlying renal disease okay vesico urethral uh, urethral reflux vesico urethral reflux which is a condition that the uh, sorry that the uh, urine will come back from the bladder to the ureters okay the normal pathway of urine is from the ureters uh, ureth ure to the bladder if we have a condition of retrograde a flow of uh, uh, urine from the bladder to the ureters due to valve problem or something like that so we have a risk factor for uti okay neuropathic bladder neuropathic bladder as a result of a spinal injury is an important risk factor for uti because uh, of incomplete emptying in that condition and in incomplete emptying is a risk factor for stasis of urine and subsequent UTI okay now after talking about the risk factors of UTI the majors and the ma minor like constipation 
stones, pregnancy, female uh, sex, uncircumcised male, congenital or anatomical anomalies, hypertension, neuropathic weather. Let's move to the microorganisms that are responsible for UTI. What are the major microorganisms that are responsible for UTI? The first and the most important one and the most common one to cause UTI is Escherichia coli, okay, E. coli is the most with about 75 to 90 percent of females with UTI. The underlying microorganism is E. coli, okay. This is number one. Number two is Klebsiella. Klebsiella is the second uh, most uh, uh, common microorganism to cause UTI. The third one is Proteus, okay. The third one is Proteus. There are some researchers say that a Proteus is as uh, common as E. coli to cause UTI in males. Okay, so it is more common in males, but it is not uh, uh, yet proved. Okay, but remember that Proteus is the third uh, most common uh, microorganism to cause UTI and is more common in male. After that, the Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas uh, especially happens in structural abnormalities also a risk factor for UTI. Also viruses, some viruses can cause UTI like adenovirus 21 for example, okay? And these virus, uh, viruses are especially responsible for cystitis with hematuria, cystitis with hematuria. Sometimes in atypical cases, of UTI we may have fungal infection okay fungal infection so in most of cases we have E. coli then Eclipsilla the, then Proteus then Pseudomonas and structural abnormalities so if we have a case of non E. coli UTI we have to ask ourselves why it is not E. coli is it a recurrent UTI is it a nosocomial UTI is it fungal UTI, fungal UTI is predisposed by immunodeficiency, uh, pregnancy, or cases of long administration of uh, antibiotics. Okay, so now until now we talked about the urinary tract infection, epidemiology, risk factors, and the microorganisms that are responsible. Now let's move to the pathogenesis and pathophysiology of UTI. Okay, most of the times. UTI in near most of cases is an ascending infection. What do we mean by ascending infection? It means that we have a fecal flora and perineum, okay, or under pubes of the uh, penis, okay. That flora will move uh, to the urethra, okay, ascend to the urethra, and after that will ascend to the bladder causing cystitis, the first type of UTI, cystitis. It may in sometimes ascend uh, to the kidney, okay? And when it ascend to the kidney, we call it pyelonephritis, pyelonephritis. In kidney, normally we have what we call anti-reflux mechanism, okay? What do we mean by anti-reflux mechanism? A mechanism that prevents the urine to get, come back from the pelvis of the kidney to the collecting tubule. So this is the collecting tubule and this is the pelvis of the kidney. The, there are some anti-reflux mechanisms that prevent the back flow of urine from the pelvis to the collecting uh, uh, tubes, okay? But sometimes we have some papillas, okay? Especially in the upper and lower loop of the uh, kidney, we have some papilla that uh, uh, permit the urine to reflux into the collecting tubule and that will lead to inflammatory response okay inflammatory response and scarring and that's why we have scarring in some cases of uti severe uti because of the backflow of urine from the pelvis to the collecting tubule and as a result inflammation happened okay and that inflammations will lead to scarring okay so most of the time it is an ascending infection 
uh, in some cases rarely we have hematogenous spread this is especially in neonates okay we have hematogenous spread by blood or in cases of endocarditis endocarditis actually one of the mechanisms or that predisposed for uti or help the bacteria to invade the urine tract is the presence of what we call pili and fimbria in uh, Escherichia coli okay fimbria and pili fimbria we have type 1 and type 2 fimbria type 1 fimbria actually is, uh, is a presence in most of e coli uh, subtypes okay and the, the, the type 1 uh, fimbria uh, can be avoided by what we call manose uh, d manose uh, complex uh, on the urinary tract we have the d manose complex okay that uh, prevent the fimbria in type 1 uh, to uh, invade the urinary tract but in type 2 fimbria okay or type p fimbria p fimbria we have no manose uh, sensitivity okay the manose receptors that prevent uh, the type 1 fimbria from invading the urinary tract is uh, is uh, not able to uh, prevent type 2 fimbria to adhere to the uh, uh, urinary tract so okay so we have type 2 fimbria in certain species of e coli and type 2 fimbria is responsible for the severity or the uh, invading of e coli to the urinary tract okay so this is the first two parts of pathogenesis and pathology the ascending infection hematogenous spread okay the rule of pili and fimbria in uti now let's ask ourselves why in toilet training we may have a uh, uti because in toilet training we have what we call a bladder bowel dysfunction what is bladder bowel dysfunction the child will try to retain will try to uh, retain the okay let's just okay i'm sorry very much okay the child will try to retain the urine in his uh, bladder and the bladder sometimes will have involuntary contractions and the result of this two powers the child try trying to retain the urine and the bladder involuntary contractions we will have high pressure turbulent urinary flow and this high pressure turbulent urinary flow will cause incomplete emptying of urine okay and the incomplete emptying of urine is one of the most important causes of uti okay so this is why we have a uti in toilet training because of bladder bowel dysfunction why when you have stones we have uti because the presence of stone we have an obstruction obstruction is a predisposing factor for stasis okay or the underlying path uh, physiology of stasis okay and stasis will lead to uti in constipation why is constipation is a risk factor for uti because in some cases of constipation we have bladder dysfunction and UTI so this is the path of physiology of UTI we talked about the risk factors the microorganisms and the pathology and path of physiology of UTI now let's move to the fourth subject the classification okay and clinical manifestations of the UTI how will the patient come to you okay first thing the patient may come with asymptomatic bacteriuria and what do we mean by asymptomatic bacteriuria it means that in urine culture we have more than five uh, or fifteen uh, sorry fifty thousand uh, colonies of bacteria okay and we have no symptoms then this is a uti okay but it's asymptomatic bacteriuria then we may have cystitis and i told you that cystitis is a bladder only involvement of uti okay the uti in a bladder 
is called cystitis. What are the symptoms of cystitis? First thing to note is that we have no fever in most cases of cystitis or very low grade fever. Okay, because when we differentiate cystitis from pyelonephritis, which is the involvement of kidney in UTI, we will notice that in pyelonephritis we have more than 39 fever, okay, Celsius. But in cystitis we have no fever. What other symptoms? We have dysuria, urgency, frequency, suprapubic pain, okay, and incontinence. So it, all of them are urinary symptoms because the adherence of E. coli to the bladder will be uh, try to will be compensated by uh, mechanisms of the bladder to avoid the that adherence and the, the, the those mechanisms are urgency frequency increase the frequency okay and so on so these are the symptoms of cystitis we have many types of cystitis actually i'm talk about them in a, a title just okay we have acute hemorrhagic cystitis and it's uh, especially caused by viruses like adenovirus and maybe caused by escherichia coli okay so acute hemorrhagic cystitis with bleeding we have eosinophilic cystitis with a case of allergy okay and you have to give antihistamine in this case and we have interstitial cystitis interstitial cystitis actually this type of cystitis is more in adult okay it's not very important the important thing that cystitis is the infection of the bladder inflammation of the bladder with urinary symptoms now the second symptom uh, or the second type of uh, uti is pyelonephritis pyelonephritis is a kidney involvement on of uti and the most bacteria uh, it is the most common bacterial infections in uh, infection in unit okay bacterial infection the most common bacterial infection the most common Overall infection is respiratory infection, not bacteria, but the most common bacteria infection neonate is pyelonephritis. What are the symptoms of pyelonephritis? The most important one is fever more than 39 Celsius. The symptoms of pyelonephritis are systemic sy uh, symptoms, okay, and neonates, uh, the symptoms are uh, is, uh, sepsis, okay, in infants. We have non-specific symptoms like poor feeding, irritability, okay, jaundice, and weight loss. Because in infants, the pa the baby is unable to tell the urinary symptoms, so we have th those symptoms: poor feeding, irritability, jaundice, weight loss, and other non-specific symptoms. Okay, continuous crying, for example. Okay, in older children older children we have more specific symptoms we have fever we have malaise we have abdominal and flank pain we have urinary symptoms the patient is now able to tell his symptoms we have nausea vomiting diarrhea okay so in gi we have nausea vomiting diarrhea abdominal and flank pain okay we have fever malaise and urinary symptoms okay also pyelonephritis have many uh, entities okay we may have a scarring due to pyelonephritis and the pathophysiology i told you why may we have a scarring okay we may we may have what we call acute lobular infection okay and uh, this acute lobular infection is important because it may uh, predispose to presence of mass okay and the presence of mass after acute lobular infection is called nephronia nephronia okay and nephronia may lead to renal abscess and we can only see the renal abscess on imaging okay so we have acute lobular infection the acute lobular infection may cause uh, lead to mass which we call nephronia and that will lead to renal abscess also we have perinephric masses masses uh, peri the uh, kidney like in vertebra or in psoas muscles okay P 
perinephric abscess and actually when we have abscess most of the times we have about uh, 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 20,000 to 25,000 per millimeter uh, uh, okay uh, YPCs okay the YPCs will be uh, about two th uh, two uh, 20,000 to uh, 25,000 these are the symptoms the classifications of the UTI asymptomatic bacteriuria okay cystitis in the bladder if it is in the uh, kidney is pyelonephritis pyelonephritis has many types abscess scarring or many complications nephronia and so on okay now uh, we, la let's move to the diagnosis of pyelonephritis uh, I'm, I'm sorry but diagnosis of UTI how do we diagnose UTI to suspect what do we what do we do to suspect if we have a symptoms of UTI you have to suspect UTI if we have urine analysis readings okay that suspect UTI so you can't diagnose UTI with urine analysis only urine analysis is a suspicion or can give you a high suspicion of UTI but can't confirm the diagnosis okay what things can we see in urinalysis that may suspect UTI the presence of nitrates and leukocytes okay leukocyte strays is very indicative of UTI it will be they be will be positive in UTI okay the presence of microscopic hematuria actually microscopic hematuria is not specific to UTI but in the cases of acute cystitis we may have microscopic hematuria okay the high YBCs or the presence of YBCs casts in the urine will indicate renal involvement. Okay, so the microscopic hematuria, the nitrites and the leukocyte strays. Okay, and the pyuria. What is pyuria? It is leukocyte in urine microscopy. Presence of leukocyte in urine microscopy. The pyuria may be sterile. What do we mean by sterile pyuria? It, uh, do mean, it does mean the presence of leukocytes in urine but with negative culture. What are the causes of sterile pyuria? The viral UTI or renal abscess or the partially treated UTI. Okay, so let's just get back to our subject. Urine analysis, what we can see in urine analysis, nitrate leukocyte strays, the microscopic hematuria, and the white PCs cast in re renal involvement what if we have negative urinalysis can we exclude uti no of course we can't exclude uti by negative urinalysis if we have negative urinalysis and asymptomatic patient okay with no symptoms we are unlikely to have uti but still we may have uti okay if we have negative urinalysis and symptomatic symptoms uti is still very uh, possible to happen okay so this is how to suspect uti now uh, also uh, th uh, we have to do blood culture because uh, we may have sepsis as a complication of uh, sh uh, uh, something uh, to present uh, uti okay w cpr may be also uh, uh, CRP I'm sorry we may be also elevated C-reactive protein okay procalcitonin may be also elevated so th these are the uh, tests we do to diag uh, to suspect UTI so what do we do to confirm the presence of UTI before that I want to talk to you about the way of obtaining the urine sample how do we obtain a urine sample from the ch from a child okay we divide this into two entities toilet trained babies and non trained uh, babies babies that are not trained on toilet okay in toilet trained baby we have to take midstream urine sample okay midstream urine sample and we have to clean the clitoris and the uh, prepuce in uh, males okay before taking the midstream urine sample not to be contaminated in non trained babies or children we can do catheterization or suprapubic aspiration okay 
these two are the most reliable two methods in non-trained babies okay catheterization catheter insertion of the urethra and the bladder and suprapubic aspiration some cases we use collecting pack and collecting bag actually is not that reliable because we may uh, have contaminated bag okay from the skin or other things okay so it is not useful it is useful in one case in negative culture okay if we take and collecting bag and it's negative then it's a diagnostic for non-uti case yes. so now let's back to the confirmative diagnosis of uti we suspect uti for example by urine analysis how to suspect that the diagnostic or confirmative test is urine culture urine culture okay and urine culture should be uh, taken in a prompt okay uh, speed uh, because in uh, 60 minutes it will be over contaminated with minor contaminants okay due to the temperature of the room and it will give us false positive so we have to hurry up taking the urine culture and sending it to the lab okay how urine culture diagnose uti if we have more than 50000 of single pathogens okay we can diagnose uti if it is if it has symptoms then it is symptomatic it uti if it has no symptoms then it is asymptomatic bacteriuria is this the only thing to diagnose uti in urine culture no if we have also 10000 uh, uh, colon colonies in, on urine culture uh, plus symptoms okay if we have symptoms we diagnose UTI so over than uh, 50,000 colonies is diagnostic for UTI or 10,000 colonies with symptoms is diagnostic for UTI what are the atypical features of UTI okay sometimes we have atypical features of UTI we normally have urgency frequency may sepsis fever or other things okay sometimes we have atypical features that uh, are abnormal to have in UTI like non E. coli uh, underlying uh, microorganism as we said okay failure to respond to appropriate antibiotic after 48 hours okay normal to response within 48 hours after that it is abnormal or atypical uti poor urine flow also elevated creatinine okay abdominal flank or suprapubic mass so, so the presence of any mass is abnormal in uti the, the uh, un, non e coli uti is atypical e coli failure to response to therapy is atypical poor urine flow okay or elevated the creatinine as a uh, as an indicator of kidney failure or something like, something like that okay this is how to diagnose uti in the next video i'm going to talk about the full management of uti okay thank you very much for watching this video see you in the next video